Hello, hello, and welcome to the ABZ show. And today we're talking to another Ibrahim, but to someone who's super cool in the ecosystem who really smashed his way into the business world. I give you Ibrahim, everybody. Hey, Ibrahim, how are you? Hey, Eb, I'm, I'm great, really good. Thank you for having me at the show. No, it's a pleasure having us. So please tell me more about the Smash Room and tell me more about what you do and how did you get here? So, uh, well, oh, where do I start? Uh, the Smash Room, let's start from the Smash Room. So the Smash Room is, is this place where you can go and break shit to release stress and have fun. Uh, as simple as it sounds, how people come down and get geared up with safety gear and stuff, and then they choose uh, things to smash. So from glasses to electronics, like laptops, uh, printers, uh, TVs, uh, washing machines, uh, your ex gifts, whatever you like. Uh, and then you grab some smash weapons, I call them. So we have like from baseball bats to sledgehammers and, um, uh, you know, axes, anything, whatever we have from the selection, you go into a room, there, there is a safety briefing inside before you get into and start being uh you through you through self so so to me it's it's not just about breaking things it's about uh, it's a way of self-expression uh in a way uh, you, it's it's different we've all been you know raised up in an environment where it tells you what are the things that you should do and what are the things that you should not do and breaking things is obviously one of the things that we were not allowed to do when we were kids and here's this place where it tells you you know what uh, Actually, be as wild as you can, break as much as you can, be crazy, yell, scream, shout, curse inside the room, because whatever happens inside the Smash Room stays inside it. Wow. I, I, I'm just curious, how did you really fall into this idea? It's just something that is um, uh, really out there, and uh, you know, it's something that definitely would be a good release for everybody. So I, 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 I want to hear your creative thought behind that. Sure. So uh, this really takes me back to my, uh, I would say, roots in entrepreneurship and how I get started. And uh, uh, it, it, it was a, it, I've never been always that entrepreneur. You know, there are some people who tell you, oh, I was an entrepreneur since I was five years old. I started selling lemonades on the streets. No, I wasn't that person. You know, um, I was I was an employee for uh, for I would say the majority of my professional life. Um, I went. Uh, I went to school. Then I went to engineering to study mechanical engineering. Uh, I, I had. I had some sort of a choice, but obviously my family wanted the title of you know their son being an engineer. Uh, but I get to choose mechanical engineering because I like cars, and I thought if I studied mechanical engineering, I would study something about cars. Unfortunately, that was just a myth. There was only one elective subject in the whole five-year study. Uh, I studied in Jordan, by the way, and uh, graduated, got a temporary job for like three months in Jordan with Toyota, and then got an offer to move to the UEE. Obviously, I took it. Um, and uh, that's that's back in 20, I would say 2010, which, which makes me uh, remember how long I've been here already. It's just over 10 years and just time flies. And why I mentioned this, because since then I, I joined Ford and then for like a blue collar job and then moved to corporate life and in corporate, I spent more than five years. I, I climbed the corporate ladder, as they say, uh, uh, from someone who's like a newbie to all the way to a senior country manager. Um, just before when I thought everything is perfect, looks fine. I drive a brand new car every year and, uh, you know, benefits and, and stuff. And, uh, you know, I get to sit with general managers around the region uh, and owners of car dealerships. You know, it's family businesses. So it's, it's really some really great exposure. And of course, came with its benefit in terms of like money, compensation, all that kind of stuff. And I was still young. I mean, I'm still young too, but uh, at that time I was like, I thought I'm the youngest country manager in the whole history of the, the company. And by the way, it's an international company. So uh, it was something cool. Uh, only one day I, w I, I walk in the office and uh, my, my manager, the sales director calls me and just fires me on the spot. It's like, Ibrahim, go. And the HR will handle the rest of the situation. Uh, I've never even in my darkest, wildest 
thought I would ever thought about leaving the company that way because I've been this guy who's being consistently promoted every year. So it didn't make sense. Whatever the reason that, you know, the, the reason they fired me for, I thought that was the end of the world at that point. Only, only to see that, no, it's not yet. I uh, had to deal with divorce after a month from being fired. So I find myself in a position where I have no job uh, with, you know, lots of liabilities because we live here. We get set up in the lifestyle. We love the lifestyle. It's easy to get into debt regardless of how much money you earn. Mm-hmm. And then you have to maintain this lifestyle. Sure. But then your main source of income is cut. And, and then you need also to think about visa. You need to think about all these kind of things. Add salt to the wound, deal with a, a divorce after five years of marriage. Now, actually, it was my decision, just to be clear. So at, at that point, I thought getting fired was possibly the lowest point in my life. Looking at it today, I think it's one of the best blessings that I've ever received. Uh, and I think it's it was that crossroads that uh, uh, made me uh, realize that uh, the corporate world, the job uh, world, is not anymore for me. Uh, the universe wanted to test me right away. So three months after being, uh, you know, jobless and uh, I'm just discovering what I want to do, I've always wanted to say like I start a business or something, but I didn't was I didn't know what to do, what to start a business in. I've never had an experience. I always had like some small side hustles, like a souk before Amazon, a souk store, uh, selling a few stuff, uh, a few things here and there, teaching English to some people, whatever it is, uh, but then not a proper business. Uh, The universe sent me a bigger company in the same field uh, with a bigger offer, uh, better salary, uh, better job title, and I said, here you go take it. And I thought, you know what, I'm, uh, I decided to go into the entrepreneurship field and I want to be an entrepreneur and I want to start my own business. If I take this, I'm going back in, in, inside the same loop. And, and uh, I want to, you know, burn the bridges behind me. And that's when uh, I would say the, the carriage came and I said, like, you know what, I'm, I'm turning this offer down. Uh, and I'm not gonna regret that. And until today, uh, I'm I'm so proud of myself. You know, at some point, you think about the the decisions that you make and how proud you are of it. I'm so proud that I didn't take it, despite the, the people around you were saying you're crazy, like you're you're insane, you're out of your mind. Because like this is nice money. This is nice. This is the best company. Everyone is dreaming to join that company. It's the biggest yes. manufacturer in the world. But yeah, looking at this, at it today uh, what was, was possibly one of the best decisions I've ever made. So how this mushroom came in, um, I went to London to uh, attend Tony Robbins' Unleash the Power Within. And uh, as, as part of his uh, five-day or six-day seminar, he, uh, he gets everybody to walk on fire, burning coal. I'm not kidding. So it's, it's, it's no joke. It's actual fire. There is, there is actually an, a video on YouTube of Oprah Winfrey doing the exact same thing. 10,000 people in London from about 70 different nationalities. Amazing, amazing energy, amazing immersive experience that would possibly change everybody, anyone's life. And that was a turning point for me. Uh, I came back and I started questioning a lot of, a lot of my life decisions, a lot of my um, limiting beliefs, a lot of the, the belief structure that, I've, that I had. Uh, obviously coming uh, from a very uh, conservative uh, society, very conservative family, and, uh, you know, telling you what are the, the th- how do you do things, how you should behave, how you should act, how you should be, uh, all that kind of things, uh, instead of discovering yourself and what you actually want to do. So in a group of uh, people who actually went to London, uh, but live in Dubai, they were like sort of like a support group where everyone needs to, talk about what they want to do. And I was in that period where I want to start a business. I'm not sure what what is it. I met uh, Hiba, who's now my uh, co-founder at the Smash Room and one of my best friends. Uh, she, she tells everybody about uh, when she lost her grandmother and how hard it was uh, to her. She she studied psychology, but uh, she was so close to her grandmother that she couldn't deal with it through the normal ways uh 
she went to gym, she did kickboxing, she did yoga, she did meditation, nothing worked until she was just moving to another place. And uh, she's Canadian. She's, she, she has a baseball bat always in her home. I, 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 don't ask me why. So she takes this baseball bat uh, along with an old uh, printer and a TV to the backyard and just smashes the hell out of them. Something felt like, you know, got off her chest. And I said, who? Wait a second. I, first of all, I need this. I need this more than anybody else at this point. And this can be a great business idea in Dubai. Obviously, being in that mindset at that time and seeing, you know, how hard it is to deal with this situation, I thought I'm not the only one who would be dealing with this situation in Dubai. A lot of people lose their jobs. A lot of people lose, uh, you know, loved ones. A lot of people go through tough time all the time. So they need uh, a release. And that's when uh, we start. I mean, that's the, I would say, the roots of the idea. It took us maybe a year to materialize on that after. Uh, in between, I started a business, uh, my own business in the, in the cars industry. Failed miserably. Until then, after a year from talking about the concept, doing a research, um, you know, looking at different uh, similar places around the world, the Smash Home Born. Exactly on the 18th of March, 2018, that's when we opened. And uh, speaking of that, in, yeah, in 10 days, we'll be celebrating our third anniversary. Nice. So your story is like very inspiring, especially, um, when, you know, when I talk to a lot of uh, entrepreneurs and founders, uh, there was, uh, there's always something that fuels them. But also people who've, you know, talked to me before, I always, you know, especially society in, in the Middle East, um, we have this huge uh, cloud uh, on top of our heads called failure. And nobody wants to know or no, wants to talk about uh, failure or even wants to experience that failure aspect. When we talk to, when I talk to at least a lot of them, I tell them, okay, imagine what is your worst case scenario or what I call the rock bottom situation. I've personally been there a couple of times in my life. And I think because I, I've done very edgy uh, uh, sometimes decisions or very aggressive decisions. But uh, I like how you coming out of, uh, you know, when you were let go from your company and then even your personal life uh, kind of crumbled that time as well. And then you fueling yourself to get up and go again and start something. And then one good thing led to another. It obviously got a job offer, but you said, you know what? I've already experienced my rock bottom. Let's see what I can build for myself. That's you know that's a good story to come out of. So okay, so you've you've touched on something that is I want to talk about, which is that little business that you opened for a year and it failed miserably. Um, can you tell me what was the main reason why it failed? What did you learn? I think failure always grounds people, right? Like if you keep succeeding, you know, your ego becomes so inflated, but you know, your ego doesn't even fit in a room, right? I actually personally love to talk about failures for the same exact reason that you mentioned, because of the, it's considered as a taboo in, in, in our uh, society, in the Arab world, even in general. Uh, you talk about the education system, you talk about schools, maybe some people will get uh, upset uh, from this, but uh, honestly, the way the, the school is being structured like you have to remember the right answers. That's not how life works. Life works by, you know, trying and failing and then trying and failing and then succeeding at some point. So by learning not to make a mistake in school, your brain get conditions all over these years that this is the way to live your life. The moment you leave school and, oh my God, no, this is different. I actually didn't have a manual to read from. And that's when people start, you know, that the reality check uh, hits. Uh, I've, I've learned a lot from my own mistakes and uh, I've, I've made horrible mistakes. Uh, I've, I've lost lots of money. One of them was this uh, car business. So uh, naturally, because I came from the car industry and I wanted to start a business. So naturally, you think about, you know, where's your area of strength, what you know the most about. Uh, I love cars, and uh, I also know something about them that a lot of people don't. Uh, I saw a problem, which is uh, the lack of trust in the uh, used car market. So uh, I wanted to sell used cars that are, uh, you know, with certain certain quality, uh, certain specifications, like, uh, for example, GCC specs, no accident, almost a brand new car, but like a slightly used brand new car, let's say. 
uh, with a consistent uh, quality mark that people know dealing with this business, uh, you know, means I don't have to worry about buying a used car anymore. Uh, but the plan was to actually create a platform to sell those, to, to list those only good used cars on these platforms uh, for other dealers or people to sell and people also the normal people to find these cars and buy them. So I found, I found myself two partners that uh, being no entrepreneur before, I turned uh, to friends and uh, amazing people again, uh, but horrible business partners. <laughs> so, um, uh, those friends were uh, ex-colleagues too. They happened to be uh, working with the same company I used to work for. Uh, you guys know yourself. I love you so much, but um, we're talking about business here. So, so they they kept they kept their day jobs. Uh, I had to build everything from scratch. We didn't talk about co-founder agreements. We didn't talk about the details. We didn't write anything. Uh, we didn't define responsibilities. All of these naive uh, mistakes that people uh, uh, first take on, on their first startup, and possibly more if they don't learn from the from, from the same mistake. So, so yeah, hard work, but then uh, I realized, you know what, uh, and at that point, I started actually working with a business coach, uh, an Australian guy who lives now in the UK. Uh, he started opening my mind to, uh, you know what, the mistakes that I didn't see in. Because, like, I was like, okay, we're making money. The business was actually making money. We were profitable. We were making money on every single car. So, looking at it from outside, we are making good money. And we can be on our way to sort of like create that platform in a few months time or to start creating that platform. But then it, uh, he opened up my mind to, uh, to the idea of getting paid, co compensating, uh, you know, uh, actually uh, getting at least a fair compensation for, for my time, you know, covering the, the basics. Uh, yep. not, not, not something similar to my corporate job, but, you know, covering my rent, covering my basic expenses. Uh, and then focusing on, on the business itself and, and how to grow it. Uh, uh, plus, um, he asked me to, to sort of like start confronting them and uh, get things done right, uh, you know, right with written, written stuff and document everything. And that's when, uh, despite the fact that the business was profitable, after a few, a few months, I had to shut it down. Yeah, so, you know, this is something that you've mentioned that is, um, I hear that a lot. And uh, I think one of the lessons I've personally learned is um, I want to go to business with people I can stand to travel with, but not as close as a friend mm -hmm. because boundaries need to be set. And I think every successful venture that I've had is, is you know, from day one, everybody gets, they write down exactly what they're going to do. And then we see where the overlap because, you know, uh, I, you know, the miscommunication happens always in the overlap. Because if you have right. two founders, and you know what, uh, or three or four, this is something that is very, very important to talk about and clear, set clear boundaries. There's so yeah. much to do in, when starting a business that two people cannot do the same thing over and over, uh, to, uh, you know, separately because it's just time wasted. And everybody does things their own way. So there needs to be a bit, a bit of trust. And, and mm -hmm. sadly, a lot of family businesses and a lot of businesses that are based on friendship, you know, uh, A, you cannot separate your relationship between what you have personally and then what you have for work, you know, unless yeah. you've known the person for years and years and years. But then again, you would have had the discussion about who's doing what and who's taking what, you know what I mean? Like, we've had that discussion before. I've had, I've been naive before going to business with people I know very well. And then I assumed everybody will get an equal share. And then, and then you start calling people off for, hey, uh, you're not coming in. You're not helping in. You're not chipping in any money. Like, you know yeah. what I mean? And then they say, oh, you can't take salary. The business can You know what I mean? All of these have to be set. A, a business is like a baby. It needs to be nurtured. It needs to be loved. And it needs rules and discipline. And I think a lot of that that, you know, happens on the fly cannot happen on the fly you have to have the basic rules like i used to do that myself write down on a whiteboard what every founder needs to do you know and then a lot of times from that meeting when we find a founder has only one or two lines and then the other ones have 10 you know there's yeah. going to be trouble down the road either that person yeah. 
sure. picked up or just leaves. So, okay, so Brahim, let me ask you uh, a random question. Sure. Uh, and, and you know what a BHAG is? Yeah, yeah, big, okay. hairy, audacious dolls. Yes, exactly. Thank you for that. Yeah. So tell me, I know this is a very tech term, but I know you're not, not, you're not, uh, you're not as in tech as, as you want to be. Um, yeah. What is the Smash Rooms BHAG? Oh, uh, cool. We have one, actually. So we want to be around the world with the franchise system. We want to be uh, in, in 40 different uh, smash. We want to build 40 different smash rooms around the world in, in, in all the continents. So we're talking about, you know, we, we're being even specific about which uh, the U.S., how many they will get, all of that through the franchise system. Uh, that's in, term of, in terms of the number of locations. We also want to be, uh, we want to create a digital experience. So uh, uh, be it a game, most, that, that's the vision that I, I personally have for, for the brand. In the way we, uh, I, I visualize it today, how can we actually take the physical experience with, the, you know, with, with everything that comes with it, the smell, the feeling, the, uh, the place, uh, you know, the noises that you get, and translate that into the gaming world. I think that would be epic. So that's that's uh, that's the behag for for the Smash Room. Amazing. And before we wrap up, if you had a superpower or a superhero you want to be, who, what would it be, or who would you be? Oh, uh, I, this might sound cliche, but I think I am my own superhero. Uh, I uh, I think there is not enough talk about self-love and uh, in, in the Arab world, uh, there's a lot of sub- self-sabotaging that happens uh, because the way, our, you know, we grew up, the way our families uh, have been also brought up. So they transform the same experience to their kids yeah. and they want them to be the same. Uh, it, obviously, it comes out of love. They love you. They, lo- they love their, uh, you know, daughter. They love their son. But the way they translate this, it, it, it should not, it should not be uh, in the same exact way. So I think self-love is something that's really, really important. Uh, uh, people need to love themselves way more than they are today, and yes. that's why, uh, that's why I, I feel like I, I need to send this message out, especially entrepreneurs, especially entrepreneurs, because yeah, we difficult. are yeah, so they're... hard on ourselves, so yeah. hard on ourselves. And maybe maybe this is uh, this is not much of a superpower, but uh, I would love to be able to uh, be uh, a nomad entrepreneur, and that's a goal that uh, I'm working on. Uh, so this could be my attainable superpower, uh, which I'm working on, uh, and my goal is to be location independent. So uh, so I want to do whatever I I like to do. I, I enjoy whatever I do, whether it's uh, business coaching, whether it's e-commerce, whether it's a smash room or anything that else that I involve uh, myself with, I enjoy it before I do it. Uh, I wouldn't do it before I enjoy it. And I want to be able to do this from wherever I want in the world, beaches specifically. Uh, so I can just be laying down on a beach and uh, with my laptop or without a laptop and just uh, having really good time, uh, maybe in Mexico or uh, Bali or where- whatever uh, the plane takes me. Nice, very nice, very nice. Again, Brahim, it was a great. I'm gonna call. I was, uh, I'm gonna say something like very cliche and say it was a smashing good time. Uh, to talk <laughs> to you. Uh, and uh, again, guys, check out the Smash Room. Uh, I know this. Uh, I know I will be publishing this on uh, globally, but uh, I know there's a similar concept. But the Smash Room is something super cool. Thank you, Brahim, for your story. It was very inspiring, and I hope you and I wish you the best with all of your future endeavors. Thank you again. Thank you, Abe. Thank you for having me on the show. I really enjoyed this. Thanks, Thanks everyone, for watching. Take care.